Lord, we just thank you that you're here to help us. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for being the teacher and the one that waters the soil and the seed and helps great fruit to come from it. Thank you for what you're going to do here tonight, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Our first teaching to do with the seven mountain topic is going to be the teaching, the overview teaching that kind of lays the foundation and gives us the theological permission to believe the things we're going to step into when we go mountain by mountain. We will go into all seven mountains, we'll mention in a moment, which are those seven mountains, the seven mountains of society and uh, seven sectors of society, seven spheres, the seven head spheres of society. And as we go into them, we will begin to share with you, uh, just based on revelation the Lord's given me, and, and, and beginning in the end of, of 2006, the Lord began to speak to me and tell me of... Uh, the infrastructure of nations, how we could disciple nations. I had been asking him for years. My faith had been expanded to believe that we could disciple nations and uh, that we were to believe for nations, that entire nations could walk to the light of the sons of God. But I knew it was necessary to identify the structures themselves, the head structures that needed to be discipled, that needed to be penetrated, where we needed to show up and displace the enemy there. And so I had a series of dreams and encounters with the Lord where he began to speak to me. And um, he, he spoke to me uh, using the template of the enemy nations of the children of Israel when they went into the promised land. If you remember that, there were seven nations, as it says in Deuteronomy 7. There are seven nations greater and mightier than you, is what the Lord told, told Moses. But he also said, don't say they're greater and mightier than you because I'm in your midst. I'm the difference maker. And those are the Hittites, the Jebusites, the Perizzites, all the ites that you may have heard about. I suppose we could add Bud Light, Cellulite, and Termites to those, but they're not in the Bible. But the enemy nations that were there that had to be dispossessed, and says, you will go and dispossess nations greater and mightier than you. And uh, we know they didn't do that until they crossed the River Jordan. And crossing the River Jordan... They began to then take the first city nation was Jericho that followed up with about 30 more. For 40 years, they didn't have faith to do that. They didn't believe it was theologically possible. The giants were too big. And this resonates for us because we will identify in each one of the seven mountains as we go through the teachings, we will identify who I believe the Lord has shown me is the principality of each one. And we'll go, oh, that's a big, bad principality. But we'll also identify the lie that the enemy is basically sowing. There's... It's pretty simple what he does. There's uh, primarily one simple lie that he pushes in every mountain of society. It's a, a, a distortion of the face of God. It's a distortion of how things are supposed to be. And so then we'll go into what our assignment is, uh, the principle of coming in the opposite spirit of what's moving there, and, and uh, identify even some mantles and anointings the Lord has available for us. We're calling this entire... Uh, teaching and session and the sessions coming up, the seven mountain mandate and definition of mandate is a command or an authorization given by a political electorate to its representation, to its representatives. So this is both a, a privilege and a responsibility given to us by the Lord. And, and I believe uh, we will be led into uh, uh, seeing unperceived dimensions of our inheritance. To me, the seven mountain message is the kingdom message, but it's made more specific and made more expansive than what we've considered the kingdom message up to this point, where we've seen the kingdom message goes beyond salvation. We've said, well, it means also praying for the sick and bringing prophetic words, but now we're seeing that it entails even the taking of nations and bringing nations under the glory of of the Lord. So we want to uh, show you the seven mountains themselves, the seven uh, sectors of society. And again, I, I believe the Lord has shown me that we will see over 153 nations uh, that will operate under the glory of the sons and daughters of the king. So I have to lay some foundation for that because it can go against uh, previous uh, theology, doctrinal concepts that you have. So the seven mountains are 
Uh, mountain number one, media and communications. Mountain number two, they don't have to be in this order, but we're just saying in this order. Education. Number three, the mountain of government. Number four, the mountain of celebration of arts and entertainment and sports. Number five, the mountain of family. Number six, the mountain of economy or business. And number seven, the mountain of religion or worship. And that's where the church is. And that's by and large where we've recognized our mission for the last multiple hundreds of years is our assignment to get people saved and delivered. And so we've recognized our assignment on one mountain, but we by and large have not perceived correctly our assignment on the other mountains. We have re, uh, reduced it to getting people also saved on those mountains, but we want to go into the, the, the mission itself. We want to use the scripture uh, for foundation, Micah 4.1 says, And it shall come to pass in the latter days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established on the top of the mountains, it goes on to say, and all nations shall flow to it. And it also says it in Isaiah 2.2, particularly when we see things said repetitively in the scripture, is to take specific attention that it is a sure, sure, sure word. But it's, it gives us some insight that something not seen before would happen in the latter days. And we, we can recognize that we have not seen that yet on planet Earth, that in the last days, the mountain of the Lord's house would be established on the tops of the mountains, and that not only would individuals get saved, but that nations would flow to it. Nations would recognize that something is happening in the house of God, and they would begin to recognize that there is wisdom, answers, solutions, and anointing. And so we are entering into that timetable even now. Now we want to identify why we call them the seven mountains or the seven pillars. And um, we have a, a scripture, uh, first of all, in Revelation 17:9, in Revelation 17:9, it is speaking that chapter 17 of the harlot system. It's called the harlot or the prostitute, depending what version of the Bible you have. It says, "Here is the mind which has wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sits." So that becomes the one place in the Scripture that it actually uses the terminology seven mountains. But it is insightful there that. The enemy, and again, the, the harlot is the devil system. It's the devil. It's him and his principalities, however they operate together. The demonic system operates sitting on seven mountains. They understand that there's a seven-prong attack by which they are coming against the nations and coming to weaken the nations. Conversely, if we go to Proverbs chapter 9... And we won't read verses 1 through 3, but you could read there and we'll extract from there. It begins to tell about wisdom and that wisdom has built her house, that she has hewn out her seven pillars. It says she has also furnished her table. She cries out from the highest places of the city. And we understand that wisdom is even a term for the Holy Spirit. The last days I will pour out my spirit I will pour out of the Holy Spirit on my sons and daughters, and basically that will change everything. So we see that the enemy, Satan, has a seven-prong attack against the nations, against society, and that what the Holy Spirit is building is also done on seven pillars. And so, you know, we understand that seven's a perfect number. For many years, I just thought, well, seven's just a perfect number. It's just a symbolic thing. The Lord has shown me that it's not just symbolic. It's specific. There is something... Uh, 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 very um, uh, real about the number seven itself. And this thing that wisdom sits, cries out from the highest places of the city. Part of the seven mountain message is an understanding that we're not just to reach the down and outers, but we are to reach the up and outers. That was when the Lord first offended me by telling me I needed to begin to reach the up and outers. And I was telling him, I don't need that. He says, I'm not asking you, I'm telling you. And everything began to change because I found out that when we reached the mayor of the city, he opened up the whole city to us. And by the whole city being opened up to us, we saw a tremendous change both in the atmosphere of the city plus the economy of the city plus, uh, you know, we were able to have meetings in the central square and see many, many people saved, many, many people come to the Lord because of that. And we know the call out of Deuteronomy 28. We won't turn there, but Deuteronomy 28 says, and you will be the head and not the tail. You'll be above and not beneath. It's not 
uh, as we like to preach, we like to preach that we are the head, not the tail, and, and that preaches very well. But that's scripture, particularly where it's placed in Deuteronomy 28. Moses has been leading the children of Israel for 40 years in the wilderness, in the desert. They have not been the head. They have been the tail. They have been complainers. They've been survivors because they did not have faith to cross the river Jordan and go and take cities and nations, which was the assignment. So we like to preach we're the head, not the tail, but that is a promise that only comes if we accept the mission. It says you will be the head and not the tail if you go into the land and if you dispossess the seven nations greater and mightier than you. So we have been the tail. We're called to be the head. This is not our idea. This is Papa's idea. He wants us to be the head, and so he's given us instruction on how we do that, that we must take on seven enemies greater and mightier than us. We must go to these seven sectors of society and find the way, the strategies and the anointing to dispossess the enemy in that sector of society. So we want to start in the very beginning, which is a very good place to start. So we're going to go from Genesis to Revelation and doing it pretty quick. And, um, but we're laying, again, the biblical theological underpinnings for why we believe it's possible to do this and why this is an assignment we have, why this is a template for understanding an expanded perspective of the kingdom of God. So if you'll open your Bibles to Genesis chapter 1, one of the first things we have to do is point out some things that are clearly said in the Scripture but have not registered theologically in the mind of some who teach theology and doctrine of the end times. And we have had a real weak theology and understanding of the value of planet Earth. And I'm here to tell you just right up front that if you believe the earth is a disposable nest or a disposable, you know, something to be burned up, and again, there is doctrine and theology that they, they don't understand one certain passage from the Bible, and out of that they created an entire doctrine that I believe we will see is, is, uh, is not only not valid, it's very possibly demonically sourced. But let's start in Genesis chapter 1. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was on the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. Well, we want to not read it all. You all know that he began saying, let there be light, and he began to create everything. And as he created it, everything, and, we, and, and he created uh, it with, in, in a mirror representation, an image representation of things that exist in heaven. This is something we want to uh, point out, we, again, most of the, the, the points I'm going to make, I'm not going to be able to tell you the 20-minute the version of every point to prove it as greatly as I would like to. But heaven has trees and flowers and animals and rivers and mountains, and all the things that exist in heaven were made here on earth. So this wasn't like there's a robotic heaven up there, and he said, hey, let's just do something different down there. We're going to burn it up anyway. There is an image, a representation. It was well thought through every point everything that was created here. And so he would make a point when he got through creating it, starting in verse 10, said, and God saw that it was good. He would make something. He would make the seas. He said, wow, that's good. He, you know, the trees, wow, that's good. And it repeats that in verse, uh, again, it's one, chapter 1, verse 10, 12, 18, 21, 25, and 31. As he makes something, he would say, it's good, it's good, it's good. Again, we have to make this point that our God loves this earth. He loves this world that he made and created. He made it with intention and design in a mirrored representation of what's there. There is the more perfected state, of course, but it was, uh, uh, it, it was to reflect things that exist uh, in heaven. And as he did it, he would say, wow, I like what I just did. And then when he gets done with the whole thing in verse 31, it says, and he saw that it was very good everything that he had done. And indeed, it was very good. So with that, we are trying to point out that heaven, that earth is not, I say it again, it's not something that's just here to be uh, blown away, eradicated, blown up, atomic bombs. To, that's the end of days is when the Antichrist, beast, and the false prophet take over everything, and finally there's, you know, nuclear bombs and the whole thing is blown up, but it doesn't matter because this is just a passing thing. 
Now, I'm just going to let that register because it's an important point. The, the theological underpinnings are this first session. Some of you won't care about it, but a lot of you will. And, and, uh, and those who are receiving this, uh, this instruction in other nations and in in, in various uh, schools of, of ministry and thought, particularly the leaders and pastors will care about this a lot, uh, about this, this point. The scripture says the righteous inherit the earth. Scripture says the meek will inherit the earth. If the earth is junk, why is he giving that as an inheritance to the meek and to the righteous? If it's disposable, how can you have it as inheritance? I think most of you understand the concept of inheritance. Inheritance is not a loan for 10 years. Inheritance is not something you give for 20 years or until the atomic bomb blows it up. I would feel a little ripped off if he says, ask of me the nations for an inheritance. And if he says, the earth is your inheritance, but I am going to blow it all up. So I just confront whatever theological underpinnings you presently had before on that. Scripture does also say the earth will be filled with the glory of God and the knowledge of the glory of God will fill the earth as the waters cover the sea. He also says in Revelation that he will destroy those who destroy the earth. It means he values the earth in, in, in a great manner. So in our narrative, we want to establish the earth has value. Now let's go to verse 26 of Genesis 1, if you're open there. We see that God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness and let them have dominion, basically, over all the earth. We want to see the original plan is a place in the image of heaven run by sons in the image of God. And we want to point out some more things from this scripture. It's very important and interesting. Some that many of you may have already been on to. But God's saying, what's God saying? Let us make man in our image. Why didn't he say, let me make man in my image? And we understand God is Trinity. He's a triune being. So he made us in his image, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. But I want to present and suggest to you that he made man also in seven with seven facets of his face. We will look later on and see in Revelation chapter five and uh, four and five that there are seven spirits of God. This is not, again, some new doctrine I'm gonna to bring to you. So we have a God who's one, we serve one God, but he's also tri triune, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And then it tells us in the scripture that he has seven spirits. So we have a God that's one, three, and seven. He says we're made in his image. If that idea of one, three, and seven is confusing to your mind or difficult for your mind, I think a good picture that explains to us this mystery is the picture of the rainbow. And really I've seen this strong connection even in some visions, dreams that I've had of the rainbow manifesting both the seven aspects of who God is, the seven spirits of God, and the seven aspects of society, the seven mountains of society, the heaven's head spheres of society, the rainbow is also one, three, and seven. If you understand the rainbow, the rainbow is white light, but when there is this refraction between sun, sunlight, and water, it creates this prismic effect where the seven colors come out, of which three are primary colors, and they happen to be the primary colors of fire. We know that our God is a consuming fire. So when the rainbow shows up in the sky, and when there is the promise of the rainbow, when he said, I will no longer, I will never again destroy man with a flood, with water, and I believe it wasn't intended to be restricted to flood. He says, I will look at the, the rainbow, and that will convince me that even though man's ways are always bad and wicked and evil, I will not destroy. And he's saying, I will look at who I am, my nature, my personality, the full spectrum aspect of who I am. And based on that, I will have mercy. So we want to think, begin to think during these sessions, these teachings we're coming up with, we want to begin thinking of a seven-spectrum God, a seven-colored God. These are just his primary, you know, the head sectors of society. There's multiple more manifestations of who our God is, but he's definitely much more than just God the Redeemer, who is, whom we've basically seen and whom we've basically manifested to the world. We've sort of been a, uh, you know, we've had one note 
to carry. It's like if you're playing a guitar, it's ding, ding, ding. It may be a good one, but if that's all you play, it really does get boring. And, and the world has, has gotten bored with our, with our message because we've only championed a God who is Redeemer, who is Savior. And that is very, very important, but that's his manifestation on the mountain of religion. We've not known how to manifest God the governor, God who's ruler, God who understands government. We've not known how to manifest God the creative one, God that, has, that is the source of creativity. God the family man that speaks of the household of heaven. God the provider of the mountain of economy or business. One of his names is Jehovah Jireh. It's not just something he does, it's one of his names. It's an aspect of who he is. God, Mr. Good News. Media communication is a big deal in heaven. They have an archangel, Gabriel, assigned to make sure things are clear and everything must go in a spirit of good news. And how lovely on the mountain are the feet of those who bring good news. That's how his kingdom operates. God, the wise one, the educator, from the mountain of education. I think we've covered seven with that. But we want to see that there is a seven spectrum God, seven facets of the face of God that we first must see. We were made in his image, and we are to reflect that into society. Now, a mirror will only reflect what it's seeing. So if because of lack of revelation or whatever, we only see one aspect of who he is, one color, then we carry this boring one-tone message. And, and even at that, it's powerful enough, just one-seventh of who he is showing up, where there's, what is it, 30 or 40,000 a day coming to the Lord? Just with that, imagine what will begin to happen where we can showcase him in the full spectrum nature of who he is, and that becomes the seven mountain message and assignment that is upon us, that is for us to fulfill. Okay, we must continue to move along. We want to see that after he made man in his image. Genesis 2, verse 8, that he created paradise. Paradise was created and lost. The Lord planted a garden eastward in Eden, and there he put man whom he had formed. And we understand the storyline as it goes. There's Adam and Eve, and he meets with them, and he tells them that they can eat of all the trees of this magnificent garden. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat of it, you will surely die. We didn't understand that they did eat of it. They were deceived by the serpent. Eve first, she fed Adam. And then the consequences, Genesis 3, 23, therefore the Lord sent him out of the Garden of Eden. We want to understand just briefly what it means to eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, well, it was something literal they did. But from that time forward, basically man felt the freedom, deceived by Satan, felt the freedom to step into the judgment seat and look over the shoulder of God and determine whether he's doing a good job or not a good job. Well, we decide to judge God based on circumstances and based on our circumstances. And ever since then, for every one of us, our biggest battle has been to fully trust God. The biggest battle you will ever fight, your greatest spiritual battle will be over the nature of God in your life. Is he really good and can you really be trusted? Because you have circumstances that conspire against that and we have felt this freedom ever since our forefathers, our great, 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 great grandmother and grandfather, going back greats, many more greats, decided to eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil where you have the right to doubt God so that he could no longer have that kind of intimacy with sons and daughters who feel this freedom because he is absolutely perfect and good. And anything that contradicts that is just that, a contradiction, it's a paradox, something we don't understand because we're in a limited stage. Of course, that is a whole message in itself, and that's all we'll do of it, though. So we understand that in the garden, they lost their position. And I ask you something that may seem obvious, but... Uh, do you believe Adam and Eve are in heaven? Yes. So Adam and Eve did not lose salvation by being cast out of the garden. What they lost was authority. This privileged position of let man have dominion over everything. The initial plan, the original plan of God is that he would make, that the family of heaven would be in unity with the family on earth 
And out of this union and communion, there would be order, and they would have dominion over all things here in society. And yet, the moment they felt the right to eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and that was the, the agreement, he says, just don't eat that one tree, the fruit of that one tree. They were cast out. From that moment forward, we lost authority. Authority, specifically the seven areas, the seven mountains of society that we're talking about. I believe there are seven foundations of power. I believe from that time forward, there was legal right and legal authority for Satan to distort the face of God. We want to understand that these seven areas of society, these seven mountains, the seven sectors of society are things that exist in heaven. They're not just things that exist here. When we talk of government, there is government in heaven. You all understand that. He's still king up there. He's benevolent, he runs it right, but government is good when it's run right. And there is provision in heaven. He continues to amaze us with his provision in heaven. That would be the mountain of economy. There is great creativity. We will continue to see creativity in heaven, the mountain of celebration, arts and entertainment. There is good news. There is continual giving of testimonies and singing and good news reports in heaven taking place. It's an important aspect of how heaven is run. Heaven is run as a family, as I spoke before. The household of heaven, the family of God is there. So family continues to exist there. Education continues to exist. We will continue learning for, forever and ever and ever. There is no end to the revelations of who our God is and the things that he has done. And we will continue learning forever and ever. Now I'm not sure if I hit upon all seven believe I did. Well, the seventh one I didn't do is, is God the Redeemer, God who is to be honored and respected, the one we know about already from the mountain of religion. So these aspects of God exist in heaven, and it's why Jesus would then say, maybe jumping ahead of myself, I'm not sure if I have that scripture coming up, in the well-known, the Lord's Prayer, Father which art in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. I do believe we're going to get to that in just a moment. And so we will, we will look at that then. So we're going to go ahead and go to, uh, to the New Testament. Actually, I don't mention that. I don't have that scripture listed. So as we're going to the New Testament, I'll just say a little bit more about that. When Jesus is saying, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven, he's not just talking about salvation, because salvation is something uh, a provision for your soul so that when you die or when eternity uh, connects with you, you have a place eternally with the Lord. And the kingdom coming here is about the function of the kingdom. Your kingdom come, the way the kingdom functions, let it come to earth. And so he's saying the way government functions there, let it come function on earth. The way creativity functions there, let it come function here. The way family functions there, let it come function here. The way provision functions in heaven, let it come here. All seven of these mountains. So we see the ramifications of that are profound, that we are waiting for a fulfillment of that. This was not some weak prayer by, you know, Jesus saying, oh, Poppy, it would be so cool if, you know, if, if the way things work there, they work here. It's an absolute declaration, God in the flesh. When he says these things, it's not a suggestion or a weak prayer. It's your kingdom come. It is an absolute prophetic declaration of what will happen. That's why Jesus is not coming tonight yet. Because these things have not been fulfilled. It's not about knowing the day or the hour when he's coming, but there's too many things of his storyline that have not taken place for him to be coming tonight. So if, uh, if you want to call in your relatives and, and that were you know, positioning themselves to be zapped out of this planet, that's not happening tonight the way I see things. But that's just a free part. All right, let's open to Matthew chapter 4. Wasn't that good? We went all the way through the Old Testament just like that. We're already to Matthew. Now it's not, you know it's not going to be so bad getting to Revelation. And in, we want to look into this thing of the lost authority, where the enemy now had authority to distort the face and image of God. And he's done such a good job of distorting it that many people are not even sure there is the original genuine of these things. There's almost a distaste with government because we've only seen bad manifestations of government. 
There's a distaste with creativity and celebration. And so you have, again, entire denominations don't want music and other creative things because they've seen Jezebel so twist and distort things, they wonder if there is the real. Again, there's entire denominations don't allow their people to get involved in politics because politics is of the devil in their mind. And I used to think that myself. I even asked the Lord. I said, everywhere I go, they say, their government's so corrupt, that's all I hear. Is government and politics really of the devil? And he says, by and large, yeah. But he says, because you've given it to them, anywhere the sun's refused to show up, it will stay dark. So it's because we haven't accepted the mission, the seven mountain mandate is the reason these things exist. All right, Matthew 4, 8, 9, this is where Jesus is taken into the wilderness. He's led by the Holy Spirit, and he fasts for 40 days and 40 nights. And it's the great, it's the temptation uh, the testing that took place there, and there's various stages of it. Verses 8 and 9 says, Again, the devil took him up on an exceedingly high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to him, All these things I will give you if you fall down and worship me. I point out there in the parallel scripture passage of Luke 4, 6, it says, For this authority has been delivered to me, and I give it to whomever I will. So many important things are being said right there. The devil takes him up. We want to notice that it's on an exceedingly high mountain. We're speaking of the mountains. And he shows him the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And I'm going to suggest to you that what he's showing them is the foundations of power of these seven mountains. These are the kingdoms. The Greek word basilia means a foundation of power. We'll get to that in just a moment. So he's showing him the foundations of power and the glory of how things should look. He's saying the glory of government, the glory of creativity, the glory of family, the glory of provision. There is a glory to each one of these mountains. And he's saying, he's telling Jesus, he's like, I know you've come to get back the lost authority. I don't know how you plan on doing it, but I know you're here to retake the lost authority, to claim that back. And I'm gonna give you a shortcut. If you bow down before me, I'll give it to you. Of course, there was a trick and a deception built in that. And in Luke 4, 6, what we read, it says, this authority has been delivered to me and I give it to whomever I will. This is, again, very important. Though Satan is a liar, he was not lying. He did have this authority. It was lost in the garden because of sin. Because Adam and Eve sinned, they, they violated the clause, and so authority was lost. And so he was telling the truth. We want to note that he did not say, See the souls of Jerusalem? If you will bow down before me, I will give you the souls of Jerusalem. This was much more expensive than that. It includes the souls of Jerusalem and the souls of Israel. But Satan was not bartering with Jesus over the souls of those people around. It was about the kingdoms, and we're talking about the kingdoms. Remember the Son of Man to came to save that which was lost. Not just those that were lost. They're included in it. The gospel of salvation is a subset of the gospel of the kingdom. So it's included there, but it's not limited to that. We really, really must understand that. So the, the devil is bragging that he has jurisdiction. The kingdoms are the seven mountains. Again, we'll speak briefly to the word basilia. The Greek word means royalty or rule or concretely a realm, literally or figuratively, a foundation of power. And I, I just repeat it again. The kingdoms are not specifically the nations, but the foundations of power upon the which the nations are built, i.e. the seven mountains. So we want to now jump ahead into the Great Commission. That was in Matthew 4. Now we want to jump all the way to Matthew 28, where he gives out the Great Commission, because this helps us understand the context of giving the Great Commission. In Matthew 28, 18 and 19, Jesus calls his disciples to himself, he has paid the severe price on the cross. He has shed his blood. He has been beaten. And he has risen from the dead, proving his authority over death. He has made an open show of principalities and powers, the scripture tells us. And he comes to his disciples, and this is interesting, particularly in the context of what we just told you. Remember, Satan was bragging about, I have some authority you want. Jesus says, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. He says, remember Satan was bragging about that when I was in the wilderness, boys? He says, that's no longer true. 
Go, therefore, make disciples of the nations. You can now make disciples of the nation. On the cross, Jesus regained, regained legal authority over all the lost kingdoms. This included but was not limited to matters of the hereafter. Now, this gives us understanding of the scripture I don't have uh, listed, uh, but John 14, 12, where Jesus says, the, thing, the works that I do and greater will you do because I go to the Father. You all remember that scripture? I used to wonder for years, how could we do greater works than Jesus did? And I, I literally used to ask him, like, what? I was like, you walked on water. I get to run in water? <laughs> and, and, you know, you raise Lazarus after several days. What, I get to wait a week, raise somebody from the dead? And, and you're, trying to put, you know, trying to qualify and put dimensions on how we can do greater works than he did. But if we understand what just took place, we can understand an application for doing the greater works. All Jesus had authority to do was manifest his power over sickness, manifest his power over demons. And so he brought a, a measure of the kingdom. And that's where we go wrong, even kingdom teachers. They say, well, we want to know what the kingdom message is. Let's see what Jesus did. And everything Jesus did is a kingdom message. Well, Jesus just got through telling them, I just now got all the authority I need to do the stuff we got to do. So he said, I just now have all authority. I was limited before what I could do. Somebody had to pay the price first, the legal price to get back the authority. And now that I have it, you go do the easy stuff, guys. Disciple nations, not just find convert converts, disciple the nations. And they did not have full insight and understanding and revelation on it. And it is progressively being unveiled to us. And now we understand uh, better, even with the seven mountain mandate, seven mountain message, what it means to disciple the nations. So now we want you to go ahead and jump all the way to Revelation. I want you to understand as you're turning there, when he said all authority has been given to me, that that word authority is a word exousia, which means privilege, mastery, authority, jurisdiction. From that day forward, all jurisdiction belongs to him and by him giving to us the baton to us. So every principality and power on planet earth is there illegally. Every demon, every power, every principality, Jezebel, Baal, Apollyon, Mammon, everybody's there illegally. It just lacks the sons and daughters of the king with enough resolve to come and tell them they must be removed. We're going to get into that some more afterwards. All right, Revelation chapter 4. We want to give you the context of Revelation chapter 4. This is decades now after Jesus has given the Great Commission. And he is speaking with the Apostle John. John was the one apostle that did not face martyrdom. They tried it, but it didn't work. And he has this encounter. We'll start reading in verse 1. We'll read the first Five verses of Revelation 4. After these things I looked, John said, and behold the door standing open in heaven, and the first voice which I heard was like a trumpet speaking with me, saying, Come up here, and I will show you things which must take place after this. We want to make note right up front of this thing of things that will take place after this, because we're actually going to watch and observe that John begins time travel that he will be taken back in history, then he'll be brought forth, and then he will move to the future, but he will not know where he's at, and so he will be confused, and we will find him shortly in heaven crying, even though it says in heaven there are no tears. But it'll be because he's an experience, and he's not quite sure where he's at. Verse 2 says, Immediately I was in the Spirit, and behold, the throne set in heaven, and one sat on the throne, and he who sat there was like a jasper and a sardius stone in appearance, and there was a rainbow around the throne. Interesting, there's a rainbow around the throne because it reflects and manifests who he is. And around the throne were 24 thrones, and on the thrones 24 elders sitting clothed in white robes, and they had crowns of gold on their heads, and from the throne proceeded lightnings and thunderings and voices, and seven lamps of fire were burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. Seven lamps of fire burn before the throne. They're the seven spirits of God. For every darkness that exists on planet earth, there is an, a, a, a light 
a fire from the heart of who God is himself, of the seven spirits, that is, is ready to dispossess, to displace that darkness. And we, his sons and daughters, must begin seeing and connecting to that fire of who he is and begin bringing that in a very practical way to society. And when we will get into the practical steps of that as we step into the mountains uh, themselves. So John is taking up, he sees this uh, rainbow around the throne, and um, if we continued reading and skimming through chapter 4, it's just an amazing picture he's seeing. He's, he sees the sea of glass like crystal in, in verse 6, and then he sees these four, weird four living creatures, you know, and, and they have, uh, verse 8 says, they have six wings and they're full of eyes around and within. So they have eyes inside of them and outside of them, and they do not rest day or night. And they're saying, holy, <coughs> holy, holy, Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. It says, and whenever these living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to him who sits on the throne, who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fall down before him who sits on the throne, and they worship him who lives forever and ever, and they cast their thrones their crowns before the throne, saying, You are worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for you created all things, and by your will they exist and were created. What an amazing, uh, spectacular uh, view and perspective and vision and encounter uh, that John has. You know, we would all love, probably, or many of us, to have this invitation to go up and see the throne room. It's definitely not like a traditional church uh, setting at all what the throne is like. It is designed to stimulate every one of your senses to the max. It is very loud. There's thunders. There's lightnings. There's colors. There's things moving. And, and this is what heaven is like. And our churches are called to, you know, reflect that the best of our ability to do so, not be so boring. Our God is not a, gore, a boring or gory God. He is an exciting God. And so John is here and he's seen the, the, spec, you know, the spectacular uh, presence and view of heaven, but yet something is not quite in order. And this is, as we continue chapter 5, we will see that he uh, uh, begins to see something that's awry in heaven. And this, it's continuing, if you don't know that, Revelation 5 continues. It's just the same progression of this vision encounter that John had. And we want you to look in verse 1 of chapter 5. And I saw in the right hand of him who sat on the throne a scroll written inside and on the back, sealed with seven seals. Then I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the scroll and to loose its seals? And no one in heaven or on the earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or to look at it. So John sees this thing. He goes, he's in heaven, and there's all this incredible stuff taking place, and action, lights, camera, and, and, and colors, sounds, smells, everything. But Papa is sitting on a throne, and in his hand he has held out this scroll. And this scroll is a legal document. And there is a loud angel, not just an angel said, um, by the way, we have this situation. In the midst of all this other, there is an angel with a loud voice saying, who is worthy to get us back to authority that was lost on earth. That's what's being said there. And so John says that he looks and he looks and he's in his time travel. He's been taken back to the garden and after the garden and that no one in heaven or on the earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll. He's going through time travel, and he begins seeing these men of God, whether it's Moses or Abraham, Joseph. And these are incredible men of God. You know, Moses, the meekest man on earth, and he's like, he's hoping this guy can do it. He can pull it off. He can, he can pay the price so that authority can be regained. But it can't be. They all, there's sin in every one of their lives. He keeps moving forward in history. He gets, you know, David, the man after God's heart. But we know David had some problems and issues. His blood was not righteous enough to pay the price. And so it just keeps moving on. It goes through the prophets. You know, there's Nehemiah and there's Elijah and there's Elisha and there's Isaiah. And he's just man, and, uh, uh, man after God after man after God. And, and, and nobody is worthy. You know, John's seeing all this in his time travel. When it says, and he looked under the earth, I believe he was able to go all the way to the future and to see everybody who was ever going to be born 
And like, no one is ever going to be worthy. There's a reason he's devastated. John is in heaven. And he said, not just I, a tear come down my cheek. I wept much. He wept. He, he is like, oh my goodness. Papa is going to be holding that thing out forever and ever. And there's going to be an angel around here reminding us all the time that we've lost authority on earth. John went through past, present, and future history and saw no human being that was worthy to do this. We want to understand the legalities of this. To be worthy, that word worthy in the Greek, axios, means deserving. The established price of redemption was a mature man's righteous blood. Maturity, the age of maturity even till today in the Hebraic world is 30 years of age. That's why Jesus' ministry couldn't start till he was 30. He had to have overcome sin. We understand that. He was perfect with no sin in him up till age 30. Righteous, having no sin, and then being willing to offer his blood as a, a sacrifice. So let's get back to reading. We'll read again verse 4. So I wept much because no one was found worthy to open and read the scroll or to look at it. But one of the elders said to me, do not weep. Don't cry, John. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has prevailed to open the scroll and to loose its seals. And I looked, and behold, in the midst of the throne and of the four living creatures, and in the midst of the elders stood a lamb. He first pointed out that he was the lion. The lion of the tribe of Judah had prevailed to open the, the scroll and to loose its seven seals. We didn't point out that that word loose, for loose to seven seals, is a word that means dissolve, melt, put off, to cancel that which was lost, that which Satan bragged about in Matthew 4 and Luke 4. And he said, I have authority. And he looked and behold, in the midst of the throne of the four living creatures, in the midst of the elders stood a lamb as though it had been slain. Where is John now in his time travel? He's up to Calvary. He's at the cross time. And John's there, and he's seeing the lamb pay the price. He was a lion, but he couldn't come and manifest the full dimensions of the lion because he had to first be the lamb and pay the price. That's why the works that I do are greater, the greater works we will do are the lion works. We are in a lion generation. We have a lion assignment. That generation had a lamb assignment. There's a whole message on that also. To open the scroll and to loose its seven seals. Now, so the lamb stood as though having been slain, and it says he had seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out to all the earth. So full of significance, even right there. I don't know if you get a picture of the lamb of God. We have these pictures, you know, the lamb of God. He's a seven-horned, seven-eyed lamb. It's kind of freaky, isn't it? <laughs> but it's because we want to get into the significance of it. There's sevenfold mission. You know, it speaks of base foundations of power. He did not just come to offer salvation. He came to restore the full face of God in every sector of society. The job is not done until God has been perfectly re-imaged through his sons and daughters here on planet Earth. That is our assignment. That is the seven mountain mandate. He must be showcased how government works. He must be showcased how he provides, how he, his creativity his family, all the dimensions, manifestations, the full spectrum God must be manifested here. And it says the seven eyes are the seven spirits of God. And guess what? They're not hanging around in heaven. Where does it say they are? They're on the earth. Remember the scripture that says the eyes of the Lord run to and fro through the whole earth looking for those he can work with. He's doing that now. They have a sevenfold mission. We must understand there is Another mission, there is an expanded perspective and view of what yet must take place before God's plan has been fulfilled here on earth. Verse 7, then he came and took the scroll out of the right hand of him who sat on the throne. This is awesome. He takes the scroll out of the hand, out of the right hand of him who sat on the throne. And it says, now when he had done this, when he had taken the scroll, verse 8, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the Lamb, each having a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song. Jesus walks up to the Father and says, 
Papa, I have satisfied the legal requirement for us to get back the authority. I'll take that. You no longer need to hold that thing out there as a loose end. Angel, you can hush. That's done. It's taken care of. All authority is now mine in heaven and on earth, and I give it to our sons and daughters. They will finish the job. It's pretty good news, isn't it? And so at that moment, as good as their song was in Revelation 4 of holy, 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 we like it, they don't sing that anymore. They got a new song going. So they began to sing a new song. You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals, for you were slain. Had to be this price of sacrifice. And you have redeemed us to God by your blood, out of every tribe and tongue and people and nations. Now that's the thing we've rejoiced about for millennia. Salvation was brought to mankind. It's the gospel of salvation, but that was only half the song. That was before the punchline of the song. And have made us kings and priests to our God, and we shall reign on the earth. The lost authority had been regained. It was not just now we can rescue some souls. We can heal some people while the devil is, you know, dominating everything. Now, everything's changed. At the cross, everything's changed. We have been made kings and priests to our God. It's, it's specifying two types of of authority that we now have to rule and reign. Kings. He is the king, but we are kings under the king. We are under kings. When the scripture speaks of he is the king of kings, it's not really talking that he's the king of presidents and prime ministers. It's us, because he has made us kings to our God. He is the king of kings. We are the kings. We are here to exercise the authority of that kingdom here on planet Earth. Not just to get souls saved, we're to exercise that authority. That authority is to displace darkness, to displace the distortion of the image of God in every sector of society. That is our mission. When it says we are priests, it means we have the authority Jesus had to apply his blood and forgive. He has given to us, the scripture says, the ministry of reconciliation, that we would be as Jesus and cancel the sentence of guilt on people's. That's why it is uh, very high ignorance when we as children, sons and daughters of the king, begin to, uh, you know, as it were, draw bullseyes around nations and cities and say, God, come and judge this. Because we are ministers of reconciliation. And so when we, when we step outside uh, uh, of our understanding of what power and authority he's given us, then it's, it's just, it's, it's a terrible thing. And because of this, if we understand the power and authority of a priest, we would know that there's no nation on earth that has to be destroyed. There is no nation on earth that has to go wholesale to the devil. It will only be if the sons and daughters of the king did not exercise their kingship and their priesthood. Because we can go anywhere there's an assignment of death on them. And even if their righteousness is not the standard that's supposed to be there, we can say, Papa, we know this place is sin and bad. They are aborting, prostituting. They are, they are worshiping devils. They're doing all these things. We apply your blood on it. We do what you said, that we are to be as Jesus. Apply your blood. We say, have mercy. When we apply the blood of Jesus, he can come closer. He can bring his presence. See, sin keeps him away. We apply the blood, he gets closer. When he gets closer, he says, when I bring the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit convicts. So priests have the authority to call him to come closer so the Holy Spirit is released to convict the people of a city or nation, and that becomes our ministry as priests that goes along with kings. And I would like to speak more into that, but our time is up, so we're not going to do that. But we want to get to the punchline here where it all ends. 11 and 12, verses 11 and 12. Then I looked and heard the voice of many angels around the throne, the living creatures and the elders, and the number of them was 10,000 times 10,000 and a thousand of thousands. Basically, they didn't have a number for a zillion. And that's just the number around the throne. And they're saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. So interesting here. The angels, just those around the throne, come up and say, What's, the deal? What's happening? Why is everybody going crazy? What's going on with the four living creatures? What's the idea with the new song? The other song was pretty good. We really liked it. So what's changed? Haven't you heard? The lion, he went as the lamb. 
and he changed everything. You know, Papa, he's no longer holding that thing out. That angel, he's not talking anymore, saying, who's going to get back the authority? It's all done. They go, oh, my goodness. And so these zillion angels sing in a loud voice. I want to get this on Bose Acoustic in Heaven one day to see how this sounded. I'm sure they got something better than that. And they began singing, worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive. Did you notice how many of those it is? Power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. Seven aspects of who God is that each one specifically coordinates with one of the sectors of society. You can see that briefly. The seven kingdoms, the seven mountains. Worthy is the lamb to receive the power of government. Worthy is the lamb to receive the riches of economy business. Worthy is the lamb to receive the wisdom of education, strength of family, the honor of religion and worship, glory of celebration arts, and blessing of media and communications. That word for blessing is the word eulogia in the original Greek, which means redemptive conversation, redemptive news. That's our assignment on the media mountain. You know, you give a, a eulogy about something, we understand that word in English. When there's a eulogy, somebody could have been a real troublemaker while he was alive, but when he's dead, you come up and you find the redemptive news on his life. <laughs> you find something good to say about him, and that is our assignment in the media mountain, how to turn what's taking place in the world into a redemptive message. That's briefly, we'll know more about that when we get to that actual mountain our assignment. So there's a celebration that takes place. Worthy is the lamb to receive. Not only is worthy is the lamb to help us take these, but then of course we give it to him because it's his. And this whole thing, the whole story ends. This, uh, this encounter that John had where he was taken back to the garden and he's taken to the future and it all ends in Revelation 11, 15. Then the seventh angel sounded and there were found loud voices in heaven saying, the kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. It's not just talking about the nations of this world. The kingdoms are these foundations of power. The nations are built on the kingdoms, but they're not synonymous. So the kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our God. If you wonder, can we do this? John's already seen it. It already happened. <laughs> We're just going to experience it here. This becomes our assignment, our mission to join in the victory celebration that heaven is already rejoiced over when we see the kingdoms of this world fully manifested, operating as the kingdoms of our God, where we see a full restoration of the image of God here on earth, where we enter the Haggai 2 where it says, he will showcase himself as the desire of the nations. We will see him in this way, we will manifest him this way, and then our assignment, our mission here on earth is done, or at least the parts we can talk, talk about. There are aspects of mystery we do understand, but there is the new Jerusalem coming down to earth. There is value in what's taking place in er on earth. I'm just going to ask you to stand with me real quickly. We're going to pray and close this session. I'm just going to ask you to lift your hands. Lord, we just thank you that there's so much anointing and power just in being connected to the right story. Just in your narrative. There's an anointing to your narrative. There is a release of hope just being connected to the right storyline. And I thank you, Lord, that you are releasing that hope even now to your sons and daughters, even those who are watching us, those in different places, different nations, different schools of ministry, even right now. I ask the ignition, the full ignition of their hopes and dreams in you and for what you're going to do on planet earth. That it would take place even now. That there would be this new fire. Your fire. Your fire, your burning heart for the nations that would begin to grip us. And the privileged moment we have to live at this specific day and time in history and to cooperate with something that John's already saw. He saw it already happen. He was not restricted by time. He went into eternity and saw what already has already been celebrated in heaven. We thank you that we have this privilege. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. All right.